You are welcome to this brief introduction to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 58, in our short series on Facing the End Times. Most of the material that we shall share with you here can be downloaded in documents by links given in the description below. Let's get into it. This text is perhaps best known for its mystery verse. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the blinking of an eye, at the last trumpet. As the rest of the New Testament, this passage was written in the common Greek of the first century CE. Although fairly well preserved down through the centuries, the complexity of the language did mislead some copyists to make some interesting mistakes. Fourth century manuscript Sinaiticus and fifth century manuscript Alexandrinus insert the title The Lord after the second man to remove any ambiguity, whereas Papyrus 46 from about the year 200 inserts second spiritual man. At verse 49, Sinaiticus, Alexandrus, and 46 read, Let us bear the image, rather than we shall bear. In verse 50, Alexandrinus has a plural form of the verb can, and in verse 51 inserts a definite article before all. The English translation remains the same. Regarding the phrase, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, according to the Net Bible notes, quote, the manuscripts are grouped into four basic readings here. You can view the note online at netbible.org. There are those manuscripts which read, we all will sleep, but we will not all be changed. Scribes may have felt embarrassed by the fact that all in Paul's generation did, in fact, die, so they removed the word not in the second clause. A second group of manuscripts read, We will not all sleep, but we will not all be changed. Here, later scribes may have reasoned that not all of Paul's original readers were true believers, so would not all be changed, and therefore repeated the word not in the second clause. A third group of manuscripts read, We will all rise, but we will not all be changed. These later scribes may have wanted to counter those who were denying that there would be a final resurrection, so changed the verb sleep to rise, moving the word not to the second clause. And then a fourth group of manuscripts read, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. This reading has the best textual credentials and best explains the rise of the others, so should be adopted as the authentic wording. I shall rescue them from the hand of Hades and shall redeem them from death. O death, where is your sentence? O Hades, where is your goad? or sting. A 10th century CE Masoretic Hebrew text of Hosea 3.14 reads, From the hand of Sheol I will rescue them, from death I shall redeem them. Where are thy words, O death, and where is thy disaster, O Sheol? In all cases, the 1st century CE Greek New Testament, citing Hosea 13.14, reads, O death, where is thy sting? O death, where is thy victory? We have some interesting Greek terms introduced in this passage. Most noticeable are the terms perishable. Imperishable, of course, is the opposite. The state of not being subject to decay, dissolution, interruption, incorruptibility, or immortality. A second contrast uses the terms natural and spiritual. Both are adjectives. Natural, in this context, pertains to the life of the natural world 
and whatever belongs to it, the main point here is it's the natural body. In contrast with a spiritual body caused by or filled with the divine spirit, the new body that we shall receive at the resurrection responds more to the spirit of God than to the natural world. In verse 45, we are reminded that Adam, the first human, became a living being or soul using the Greek term psyche, both in the Greek Old Testament and here in the New Testament, which simply means life on earth, our current condition of being alive, thus our earthly life or life itself. Whereas we're told that the Lord Jesus became a life-giving spirit. Jesus Christ is fully human, still retains a glorified body, even while existing as God's spirit, granting life to human beings. Often means to experience a change in nature, and so indicate entry into a new condition. It does not necessarily mean that you became something out of nothing. An image is that which has the same form as something else. Thus, we currently have the same form as Adam, and one day we shall have a form similar to that of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 50, Paul says that he is revealing a mystery. In the New Testament, a mystery is a truth that formerly was not revealed or understood, and is now revealed and made clear to Christian believers. In verse 58, we're reminded that our labor for the Lord is not in vain. It is not without purpose or result. In fact, because we shall be raised back to life, anything we accomplish for Jesus on earth will bear eternal reward. An important point of grammar for all of the Greek Bible, Septuagint and New Testament alike, is the contrast between two common verb tenses. One of those tenses, called the aorist, describes action commands as a whole. It just means, do this. In a negative command, it implies, do not even start doing so. The other tense, called the present, describes actions as continual or repetitive. It often means, to keep on doing this. In a negative command, it can mean stop doing so. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, there is one present tense imperative, be steadfast, explained by immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. First century CE seekers and new believers, upon learning about promised resurrection, had many of the questions that we have to this day. Um, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Well, we have our own queries. Will my wife and I still be married? Will I still have my deformity? Will I still be ugly? Short. Tall, fat, skinny? Will I still have the same needs, drives, desire, and habits that cause me so much grief and embarrassment? And oh, will we grow old again? Will we have to die again? And why do we need a body anyway? Uh, to address this, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians has a definite structure. It began by introducing a new subject with the strong conjunction de. The gospel I preached to you was that Christ was raised on the third day. The same conjunction in verse 12 introduces an implication of this. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then your faith is in vain. But then contrasted again with the same conjunction, with this affirmation, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. But then a different conjunction provides an illustration of different kinds of bodies that exist in nature. From this, 
Our author in verse 42 and verses 42 and 45 derive two implications. Thus, there are two kinds of body, natural and spiritual, and thus, there are two forms of body, the present one and the future. Then he goes on to introduce his revelation, resorting back to that same conjunction, death, we shall be changed, providing an explanation in verse 53, for this body must change, and drawing an inference. Therefore, abound in the work of the Lord, which is not in vain. If you teach or preach through this passage, be sure to underscore historic Christian doctrines that are taught by the passage. The resurrection of the dead, the historical Adam, the incarnation of God in the person of Jesus Christ, the future kingdom of God that we await, and the resurrection of the body, that is, our bodies. If you lead a Bible discussion, we recommend that you have participants read the text aloud and then provide queries or subjects to be discussed, inviting others to bring up their own queries and discussion topics. For example, you might ask, in what ways will our bodies be different from our resurrection? And then have participants find the responses in the text itself. Some may imagine that when we die, we're going to go to heaven as some kind of a spirit or ghost. So ask, does this text sound like we shall be a gas, a wisp, a cloud, a ghost, an invisible presence, a bodiless soul? 44 through 46. Are there natural persons without a body? Well, if not, then... Will we be spiritual persons without a body? Go on to discuss what the text actually teaches. When the risen Christ became a life-giving spirit, did he lose his human body? Well, no. His natural body became a spiritual body, but it was still quite real. After reading verses 47 through 49, you might discuss, We are those made of dust, sure, but... Who are the heavenly folk? What does image mean? Do we only look like Adam? Will we only look like Jesus? Have someone read aloud verse 50 or ask them to explain in other words why we must receive a new kind of body and not just have our present one come back to life. There are several reasons for this which you can find in a document through a link in the description below. After verses 51 through 53, some will want to know what is a mystery in biblical terms, and especially, what is the last trumpet? Again, in the downloadable document, you will find several theories as to what that means. Does the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament offer any hope of afterlife? Skeptics and even some rabbis teach that the Old Testament has no hope of a continued life after death. You can refute that from the present text. And what does God want from us who have this victory over death? Not much, but it's all important. After reading verse 58, discuss how then shall we live? And when do we become too old or too poor to obey Jesus' commandments on earth? And lastly, what's important that we will lose when our body dies? So, our assignment for this week is, as usual, to read through 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 58 once a day this week from different translations. <clears throat> Reflect upon ways in which Christians are to believe and to behave as the end times approach, leading right up to the resurrection of the righteous dead. As you do so, jot down notes and queries that you want to discuss in your Bible study group. And then, as a project, as many of you who have time and interest, please write an outline or draw a chart 
of main end-time events as revealed by Jesus' Olivet Discourse and in Paul's epistles addressed to Christians in Thessalonica, adding details from 1 Corinthians 15. If you do so, then please make copies of your outline or chart and share these with members of your Bible discussion group. As you do so, you yourself will grow strong in your desire to remain faithful and busy in the Lord's work until the day you hear that trumpet sound and you are changed and rise to meet Jesus in the air.